M friends, new year, new me, or so they say. Well, this year we kicked it off with a fully 3D printed model of this AMX 50B, and if that wasn't radical enough, I'm experimenting with a different, totally over the top post shading paint job in hopes there will be at least something visible on a finished model. You know, when the whole tank is covered in dust, mud, dirty water, and grime. But before we get there, the model needs to be prepared using some not so weathering techniques. And that's what we'll look at tonight and see how they interact with such a contrasting model. I decided to kick it off with some oily enamel treatment. My favorite Manger's White Spirit and my even more favorite sepia oil paint. So, I've been wondering how a pin wash would behave on this type of surface. Whenever you have a very subtle model, be it gentle post shading, color modulation, very mild zenithal light, or even a completely plain monotone paint job, a pin wash is one of the most powerful and important techniques. We've seen it dozens of times before, right? How it beautifully flows around details and into crevices, slowly but surely bringing the model to life. A lot of modelers consider this to be the one technique that turns a toy into an actual scale replica, and I can totally agree because the science is definitely there. That's all nice and sweet, but how about a surface that's so heavily post shaded that it already, well, technically has a pin wash? An airbrushed wash, sure, but serving the same purpose. Well, gotta be honest with you, in the beginning I was like, what's the point of this? I'm just, you know, going over the places that look already perfectly fine. But after a couple of hours, I was starting to see the difference. The model had its details outlined with an airbrush, but it felt like a blurry photo, you know? And the pin wash, basically, it brought it into focus. You might know from the previous video that I pushed those contrasts as far as I could do on purpose, and I started noticing that in some places the shadows, or airbrushed pin washes, they were a bit too much. For example, the weld beads could use some toning down, because the wash made them even darker, and yeah, it's quite a lot. But then again, dust effects will tone some of them down. But it's the first observation I made for my future models. Let's just keep those shadows and outlines more subtle next time. So, here we have the model fully pin washed, and it's kind of funny because the difference isn't as striking as on my other models. But let me put these side by side. See? It's seriously like a sharp and blurry photo. The contrast didn't get toned down too much, which is okay, I guess, because before that I was like, Man, I just spent 10 hours airbrushing this thing and now all my effort is gone. But uh, yeah, let's see what other techniques will do to it. Chipping. Now, this is an interesting one. Um, okay, yeah, the French green base coat is a very unusual color. And this one is a little bit too striking, so let me try another one. Yeah, I think this will be better. <laughs> So, let me talk about something else before. My approach to chipping has changed quite significantly over the past year or so, but the founding techniques are still there. Uh, start with a layer of light-colored superficial chips, fill them with a darker steel tone, and finish it off with very subtle and controlled rust effects. However, veterans of this channel must remember those days when I meticulously painted these light chips using a paintbrush, and then the result was a 70 hour long session with a triple zero paintbrush. Nowadays I take it more easily. I just slap them on with a sponge, not caring much about their peel or anything. <laughs> I know, it always looks awful, but check this one out. While I never care too much about exact mixing recipes, steel chipping is the only case where I have an exact ratio. 5 drops of dark rust from the Panzer Aces range, and 4 drops of paint drying retarder. Either from VMS or AK, they're both amazing and act as a thinner, flow improver and drying retarder at the same time. And here's the magical part. 
It might be my subjective feeling, but no matter how bad the sponge chipping might look like in places, the steel chips always make it look good. So even large, completely out of place chips can be nicely tied together or blended using this dark steel chipping color. Basically the sponged layer is there mainly to provide randomness and of course the bright outline which makes the chipping stand out and look more three-dimensional. In the past I preferred dark grey color for this effect because it works really well with rust washes. But dark rust is a very universal color. It just looks good and it works with any type of surface, be it panzer grey, oxide primer, dark yellow, olive drab, you name it. A specific feature of this heavily shaded surface is that some chips might be standing out too much, for example in shadowed areas. Conversely, on the most extreme highlights, the superficial layer might be barely evident. This can be of course solved by varying the shade of the chipping, but personally I don't see it as such a big deal. And it would add even more hours to an already very time consuming process. Overall, my goal with chipping was never about realism, but more about adding visual interest. You know, fine texture, because lots of small chips and everything, and also outlining panels and details. Just like a pinwash outlines the crevice around the detail, the chipping outlines its edges. Sort of like in illustration, a line art, basically. And most importantly, no 70 hours anymore. Even a huge model like this can be chipped in two days, aka 10 or 15 hours tops. Not bad, huh? And because this process is a collection of techniques, the final step is adding enamel rust effects. I've tried using oils multiple times, but they always just like this enamel paint a little bit more. Now, this gotta be one of my favorite modeling techniques, but it can be very tricky sometimes. The way it has to be approached depends heavily on the color of the tank. For example, a winter whitewash. Huh, you better think twice if you want to blend rust effects over a white finish. It's possible, of course, but very difficult. A German tank in a three-tone camo? Well, there it behaves differently over each color. Strikingly obvious on the dark yellow base, but surprisingly harmonious over the olive green and red brown. I actually talk about this curiosity in detail in one of the Yak Panther videos from last year. And on this model, it was also about being careful, mostly. The highlighted upper surfaces act in a similar way like German yellow, for example, while the deep shadow parts make it surprisingly stand out as well, but in a different way, you know. Very light undercoat, the rust color stands out as a dark, rusty stain. Shadowed undercoat, the rust stands out as too bright. So it was again about applying the rust wash in controlled amounts. Well, <laughs> as controlled as possible. And then feathering the edges with white spirit. And then once it all evaporated, giving it another pass with a slightly bigger paintbrush and small amounts of thinner. And just, you know, gently tapping the surface, evenly removing the excessive paint. It's of course possible to vary the intensity. For example, these large mesh screens are supposed to be exhaust. So I prepared them for the smoke effects by corroding the life out of them. On the other hand, cast steel surfaces tend to rust less because of the various alloys. Or at least that's what I've been told. So hey, why not vary the intensity between them and slightly more rusted rolled steel plates? This effect is very helpful in my opinion because it adds a lot of richness to the surface and surprise surprise it tones down the post shading. Again in a very gentle manner, but a more subtly shaded model would have none of that visible by this point. So I guess we're good so far. Anyway, let's again rock the wet palette and do some finalizing touches before the model gets plastered with dust and mud. One reason why I totally love sculpting weld beads from epoxy putty is the detail and texture, and how you can actually make them sing with paints. A pin wash outlines the deep texture, while a silver color, a natural color of welds, highlights the individual, uh, you know, caterpillars. <laughs> this only works on the most exposed welds, of course, so I mostly tend to add this effect on horizontal plates where the crew would often walk and rub the paint off. 
thus exposing the shiny welding material. Also, it's a small cheat of sorts, but adding shiny chips on antenna bases makes them nicely stand out. Another place for this otherwise cursed paint is the running gear. These inner wheels would have their rim polished by track guide horns. Also, obviously the sprocket wheel. And using silver in small amounts works pretty well, but on larger surfaces it becomes apparent how unnatural it actually is. So when it comes to stuff like you know, these idlers, I always polish the surface with a silicone brush and graphite powder. You know, just grind a pencil over sandpaper, rub the silicone brush in it and smear it all over the surface. Now what used to be an awkward silver color is all of a sudden shiny, heavy metal awesomeness. Silver is also a sweet base color for brake lights. And once you cover them with a thin layer of clear red, the effect is very sweet and it's a cute tiny little detail. Moving on to less cute things, every metal component such as engineering tools and steel ropes is base coated in a random grey color that I like to mix from black and white. It doesn't really matter. Using metallic paints for these just feels... Uh, <laughs> you know? or. Hey, let's make a challenge. If this video gets, um, 10 likes, I'll paint them with silver on the next model. Or maybe not. We'll see. <laughs> this 50 cal is completely 3D printed as one piece, except the long gun barrel, and the detail is just beautiful. This is the type of printed stuff I'd appreciate on every model. It's just, you know, so compact and well designed, especially the ammo belt. Next up, tool handles, my standard recipe. Old wood from Panzer Aces is a base coat, followed up with Iraqi sand for the wood grain. It's quick and effective, you can't go wrong. A random gray mix was also used on the rubber parts of the wheels. This is a huge shortcoming of this kit, because the polished rim doesn't stand out from the wheel at all, while it actually should. So I had to cheat my way around it and sort of fake it with paint and now again for some enamel and oily treatment. Grey is in my opinion the best undercoat for raw steel finishes, because enamel rust colors work really, like super really well with it. You can vary the intensity to your liking, but even a very light rusty filter creates a fairly authentic old metal surface, such as on the pickaxe where the paint is already dry. Tow cables actually weren't just an ordinary cheap metal, they were sort of protected against corrosion, but again, it's one of those places where I like to sacrifice authenticity for aesthetics. However, of course, when they receive some earth washes and some gentle polishing with graphite, they're gonna look sweet. Periscopes on this model are also kinda lacking in detail, so painting them was more difficult, but this tank just has too many of them, so it would be a shame to just, you know, leave them unnoticed. And finally, some fake shadows and dirt on the wooden handles. They sort of make them stand out more. And also they can tone down the too bright wood color if that's what you desire. Well, actually this is the final part, the belt straps. I suppose they were made from leather, so that's what I went with. Anyway, this video is something of a build-up to the final conclusion of this model, and that's gonna happen in the next episode when I'll apply dust, mud, water stains, grime, oil stains and all kinds of mucky goodness. It's also gonna reveal if this over-the-top post-shading is a better approach, but right now I feel like... Mm, it's probably gonna be too much in some places. I'm certainly not gonna go overboard with the earth effects just to, you know, purposely tone it down. I'm gonna do my usual procedure to objectively see how it's gonna look like. I think it's gonna be a good learning experience and I'll probably be able to find a sweet spot on the next model. But, you know, that's how you learn. You either try something new and see how it works out for you, or you just keep doing the same thing. Which is of course fine if you're happy with it, but I personally wasn't stoked about my post-shading getting obliterated with weathering on my previous models. Actually, I think the effect got toned down a notch with pin washes and especially the chipping and rust tones. And of course, even something simple as painted details can shift your attention away from it. But of course, the effect isn't gone and that's important. 
because if this was my Yak Panther, the post shading would already be invisible at this stage. So we'll see in the next video how it's all gonna turn out and I hope I'll see you there. I'll be very happy if you find this video useful or at the very least interesting to watch and I must say a huge thank you to my patrons who make this show possible. I post on Patreon almost every day, so it's something like a blog or a magazine subscription. Because, you know, I post frequent updates from my workbench, we share ideas, discuss techniques and so on. There's actually been quite a constructive debate over this model there. So you can get access to that, we can also get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. You can get access to one week early ad-free videos, so you know, you could watch how this model turns out in the end right after we finish this video. And yeah, I'm also uploading these beautiful studio photos there and you can download them in full resolution. There's also a bunch of 3D models made by yours truly which you can use if you have a 3D printer. And last but not least, some ideas, references and inspirations for dioramas, buildings and landscapes. So I better wrap it up here and start muddying up this large steel frog. Yeah, that's how I like to call it. So until the next video, stay safe, my friends, stay awesome. And most importantly, keep building your models, don't just collect them. And yeah, I'll see you in a week. Cheers, my friends.